Support for LA's comes from the Norton Simon Museum. This summer, you can see its celebrated art collection and special exhibitions. Public programs include art classes, music documentaries, and jazz and chess events. More at nortonsimon.org. LAist and Show and Tell present An Evening with Fran Lebowitz. Author, journalist, and social observer will take the stage Wednesday, September 25th at the Montalban Theatre. Tickets and information at laist.com slash events. I always enjoy getting caught up with what's going on in law school, but Desmond, I think what I enjoy every bit as much is hearing about the pro bono work you're doing with the two clinics. Yeah, that's right. So I, I work with the um, Native Law Pro Bono Project and the Naturalization Pro Bono Project at Stanford Law School. Uh, the Native Law Pro Bono Project is uh, through the Northwest Justice Project, at least the, the project that I'm staffed on, which works with Native Americans in Washington State on uh, Indian Child Welfare Act issues. And then I uh, am part of the Naturalization Pro Bono. I'll actually be one of the leaders this coming academic year for it. And um, I really enjoy that because it's where I partner with the Immigration Institute of the Bay Area to help help them do practice interviews for students who are trying to become naturalized citizens. Wow. It's great because I know for you, you have that just pure love of the law as intellectual exercise. I hope you end up loving your work when you're done with law school the same way that you love the pro bono work you're doing. I hope so, too. But, you know, since I'm intending to go into, you know, nonprofit uh, you know, legal work of some sort, uh, well, that, that seems pretty likely. Welcome to Passing the Mantle, a new podcast from LA Studios. I'm Larry Mantle, the host of Air Talk on LA's 89.3. And I'm Desmond Mantle. I'm Larry's son, and I just wrapped up my first year at Stanford Law School. We are going to get into a really interesting topic today, how things change or don't across generations with our identity through work. And that particularly means work that can be so incorporated into someone's life that that is who they are in the world. And for other people, it's just a job. It's a means to supporting themselves. I so love my work. And for me, you know, when I was a student, I I was always pointed toward, I want to do something that I really care about. I never thought about, oh, I want to do a particular job because of the amount of money it will make. And my parents so encouraged me in that way and encouraged me to do something that was really meaningful that I could really commit myself to. And felt a real sense of satisfaction in doing. Because I, I remember them saying to me, you know, it, it's really, it'll give you satisfaction if you're making a contribution in some way. You're feeling like you're adding value in some small way to the world. Yeah, I certainly feel that, you know, as, as a motivating factor for my work as well, just wanting to, to help, wanting to improve things. And, you know, I think that's a powerful motivator. Yeah. I remember working at my uncle's gas station, cleaning the restrooms. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and a difficult job, a public restroom, you know, and, and cleaning it. But I felt a sense of pride that it was it was going to be perfect when I was done. And I I took pride in that regardless of, of what the job was. I think it's really important to note that there's no job that, you know, is, is too menial. I really hate that term, menial work. It's so, uh, you know. Drives me not. There is no menial work. All work is meaningful. It's all about contributing something to somebody that they're paying you for. And that's all, you know, that's the whole reason it has value. I, uh, you know, I, I've sometimes heard occasionally peers, not in, not in law school, but younger, you know, say something like, well, I'm too good for that job. I'm like, no, no, no. If you think you're too good for any job, that job is too good for you. And I think, you know, we're very fortunate that we have so many people that we see in our world today who, regardless of the job they're doing, take a great deal of pride and ownership and, and wanting to do it well. Do you see that in your generation? Not as much, no. At least not among uh, folks who are are you know born in the United States. I see a, a fair amount of this sort of like great resignation type of pattern where you know, a lot of folks are not as interested in working, um, or they're they're very very attuned to the work life balance issue, which I think they should be. Of course, you know I, yeah. I think having a healthy work life balance is is excellent. Um, but I see it often taking taking precedence, being a real priority as folks do the job search. Perhaps sometimes even more than the substance of the job itself. You know, it's so important to get home and spend time with family. Maybe Maybe they're losing sight a little bit of making sure the job itself is something they're willing to do. How do you think one finds that balance? Because 
I feel like in an effort to try and protect or carve out that personal time and that sense of balance, that people have felt like they have to be less emotionally committed to their job. And I I don't quite understand why that's a necessity, why one can't still be deeply present when doing the work, emotionally committed to the work as well, but still setting boundaries. Well, you know, Dad, you and I are a little unusual. Weird. In, weird, you mean. We're weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, because you and I both do that. We can show up to the job and be really passionate about the job and then clock out and have no more passion left for that. I mean, we, we, we have it on the next passion day. Passion goes to the yeah, next but thing. Say passion yeah. goes to the next thing that we're doing. on. Other, yeah. We just sort of turn our focus all at once to the new thing. I know you and I both operate that way. I get the sense that that's actually a little uncommon, at least in my anecdotal. Uh, experience with you know with peers I hear that uh, a number of individuals feel like um, like like if they invest a lot of emotion in their work their whole life becomes about it and they start feeling like they have to think about work 24 7 they wake up in the middle of the night thinking about work and you know that sort of thing I think is what they're trying to avoid yeah and it can be hard if you're not in a position where you sense you have any authority in your work all the all the leverage lies with the employer then setting boundaries might feel and it might actually be risking your job to do that yeah I think that's right do you have some feeling, though, that maybe remote work or, or other modes of work leave people feeling like they're on call if they don't fully set up a boundary between them and their employer when they're not on call? Yeah, um, I think that's that's true because it's so easy to feel you have to respond to that email or the Slack message that you get. And probably some employers do want you to respond. You know, maybe the client around the world is needs an answer right away and the deal's going to fall apart if you don't respond to it. Um, so that that's a really good point. I think as people are working fewer formal hours, they probably feel like they're constantly working because technology enables anyone to reach you at any time of the day. I, I had a conversation with our senior producer for AirTalk, Matt D'Angelo Antonio, and and I said, you know, sometimes I'll just fire off emails to you late at night or whatever. I don't expect you to respond. This just It's when I think of it, I don't want to forget. And he said, but when I get the email, I feel like I need to respond. So I'm trying now, out of respect for Matt, to send the message delayed to time it to send the next morning because I don't want him to feel that obligation. I, I'm doing it for my convenience and I don't want to I don't want to burden him for my convenience. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I've even learned through law school about the uh, the six-minute billing unit because that's as small as you can go, you know, for a client is to bill them for a tenth of an hour. And so, you know, if you spend six minutes doing the prep for the call, you know, or the six minutes drafting the email and sending it out, whatever else it is, that's the unit of time that you're using it's just, you know, to, to complete all your tasks. Six minutes, and then you can bill a tenth of an hour for it. Support for Alleist comes from the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena. This summer, you can visit the museum and see its celebrated art collection and special exhibitions. Public programs include classes for adults and children, a documentary film series on summertime music festivals, guided tours, and jazz and chess events in the Sculpture Garden. There's something for everyone at the Norton Simon Museum. You can plan your visit at nortonsimon.org. LAist and Show and Tell present An Evening with Fran Lebowitz. Be part of the live audience as one of our most insightful social commentators takes on current events. This is Lebowitz Off the Cuff. The evening will also include a book signing after the show along with an audience question and answer session. It's Wednesday, September 25th at the Ricardo Montalban Theater in Hollywood. Tickets and information at laist.com slash events. a sense, you know, when you were growing up that people got a lot of their identity through work and that, that was sort of the primary thing that they'd introduced themselves to be? I think uh, among the so-called educated class, definitely. It's like, I've gone to college to do this work or something like it. And so part of my cred in the world is that this is the kind of work that I do. But I think that there are a lot of other people for whom is just earning a living. It's just, this is what it takes to survive. And they didn't tie their identity at all to the work that they did. I think it was highly 
and I don't mean as much economic class, but education class dependent. And I do think for people who sort of led with what their professional life was, that that could run roughshod over their personal life because there was so much value, so much respect that came from the work that they did. I'm a teacher or I'm a doctor or I have an insurance brokerage or what that that to do those things well and to be able to compete in those areas meant that other things definitely took second place. I, I so wonder, with your generation, where people also move from job to job or even type of profession to type of profession. It's it's not like someone, in my case, going to work for a company 40-plus years before and staying with it the whole time, even through a change in who operates the company. That's not the norm. It's not going to be with you. You may work for who knows how many different employers or be in business for yourself. Uh, how does that do you think change the conception of work if it does? I do think it. I think it's it becomes more about the you know the paycheck. It becomes more about you know, I'm going here to, so I can put food on the table. I'm going here so I can be a complete human. Not my work is part of my work on earth to be a complete human, right? I think there's there's just a different frame of reference. But I'm curious. I mean, something that might shed some light on that. Uh, do you think folks in your generation? still have that sense of identity through work, or do you think maybe they've lost it as young people have come in without having it at all? You know, I don't know. I think it varies on the job. I still think for a lot of people of my generation who are in some cases approaching retirement or whatever, the, their work still is is a significant part of how they see themselves in the world. And I uh, that may change generationally, but I, I still sense that that is a significant part of of people. And often the thing, you know, when people meet each other, socialize, they start talking about the work they've done. That's how they've devoted so many years of their lives to it, along with their family, that that is a major part of conversation. It's certainly um, uh, a change in, in, in generational perception. Obviously, that's only in, in the aggregate. I still know plenty of young people who really do get a lot of identity from work and some older folks who really never got much identity from work. So, you know, there are absolutely uh, major, major exceptions to uh, to that pattern. Uh, but I do think in the aggregate, we're seeing a decline in the sense of identity through how work. Is, how do you think remote work has changed things? You've had remote school because of your freshman year in college. That was with the on set of the pandemic. You went home, you did your classes remotely. Now it's not uncommon for jobs to be done hybrid. Some of them have gone fully remote. How does that change this? You know, I think it might change it partly. I, I, I think I'm one of those exceptions, a young person who really finds a way to make work part of an identity um, where I, I just get absorbed into it and I, I kind of don't even notice a difference. I do suspect for folks who get less identity through work that um, working remotely can be a nice opportunity for them to spread the work out into better hours for them to make it mesh better with whatever schedule they need. You know, if like you need to pick up the kids at 3 p.m., you don't have to leave the office and go mm-hmm. get it right. You can, you know, go from your home and pick them up and come back and, you know, take an extra hour before dinner is made or something like that. To, you know, whatever else it might be um, to fill your, your hours. And uh, I, I think that flexibility is something that a lot of folks enjoy. I was just reading a story. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal and uh, a woman was talking about because the primary caregiving in their family fell to her because her husband uh, traveled a great deal with business, so it really fell on on her as the mom to take care of the kids' stuff and try and work in a highly competitive workplace. And she felt like that for many of her coworkers, they weren't understanding of this and, and not accepting of it and felt that she was less committed to her job because she had these additional responsibilities that, you know, her husband didn't have because he's on the road all the time. And that really struck me because I thought often this sense of how deeply people are committed to their jobs can really be skewed by what sorts of other responsibility they may be caregiving for an older family member, they may be raising kids, and that it's often women who end up with those extra responsibilities than only to have their commitment to the job be questioned. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really unfortunate thing, but I'm I'm liking that there is a little bit better understanding of of these kinds of issues. You know, when uh, when my girlfriend Kimmy had a knee surgery, I you know tried to, to help her parents care for her. I, I hope I was at least a little bit helpful. And um, 
I have had employers ask me or prospective employers ask me, you know, what were you doing for this little period of time after your summer internship ended and before classes start? And I say, oh, I was taking care of my girlfriend uh, after she had surgery. I've never had someone look on that negatively. I've, I've never had an employer feel like that was a waste of, of my efforts. And I'm glad because I do worry in a previous era, maybe that might have been, you know, maybe, maybe they would have been, well, why didn't you go to work yeah. and, you know, pay you for someone? Ambitious that, yeah, say, yeah, you were ambitious. Yeah, you were ambitious. Why didn't you, why didn't you, you know, why? And, and, and instead people saying, oh, wow, you stayed by her side while she was coming back from surgery. That's really good that you prioritize that. You know, I think they actually like um, that I have a sense of, of care for a person I love and that I wouldn't just have my identity come through work. And I, I think employers are starting to value that, and I'm glad. One of the things that I love here at L.A. is just seeing um, fathers along with mothers who are very invested in their kids and take the full parental leave that's provided. And really, it's so clear that being a parent is is of primary importance, even though they love their work. And, you know, it's very, it's very rewarding to work at a place like this that's mission-driven, and you, you see the results of what you do all the time that you put into preparing the news coverage or doing the other work here at L.A. Is that's in support of the journalism. But to see how people are so invested in parenting, when I started, it was the moms generally who were the ones uh, who who really did that and, and was great because you could you could see the care with which they brought to it. And now we see it with parents regardless of gender. And I love that. I think that's a really positive development. People talk about self-care. People talk about more openly about, yeah, I was getting burned out, needed to take a day because I just wasn't feeling right. People, when I started, would not have said that. They would not have admitted that. I think that's terrific. I love that people are more upfront about their mental health, that they don't feel they're going to be negatively judged as a result of that. And I love seeing parents who are so deeply involved with their kids and not working 24-7. But I, I do wish, Desmond, that I, I hope all of that comes still with a sense, like I see here at L.A., as to people still really committed to their work. Do you get a sense that there's maybe some meaning, too, to feeling like you're proud of your work and like yeah. you get a sense of identity from it? Yeah, I do. And and I really worry that as as people think about emotionally disconnecting from their work because that enables them to shut down and to focus on themselves and family members, these other good things that are really important to having a balanced life, that maybe they lose how their work affects other people and the emotional investment in their work. I feel like, you know, when I sold L.A. Times subscriptions over the phone because I had to to pay the rent and I hated the job, I felt still I I felt like I had it I had to be courteous to the people. I had to take pride in what I did and I hated that job. But I felt like I I needed to bring my full self to that work and to be emotionally invested in it. In those hours I was sitting in that, you know, rows of desks making those calls and being hung up on and told I was a terrible person for interrupting their lives. And that made that job tolerable. I could I could go in and do that work because I did feel that I brought my full self, that I was invested in it for the hours that I was there. I couldn't go in and go through the motions. And like I talked earlier about, you know, cleaning the restrooms at my uncle's Chevron station, I couldn't just do that like a machine. I had to feel like, you know, person's going to come in and use the restroom. I want it to be clean for them. I... And I think it is important to have that feeling about the work that we do. And I see that in a lot of people in the world, and I hope we don't lose that. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for being being committed to it. And also, I think there's a certain optimism about it, too. You know, uh, again, go back to the, the naturalization pro bono clinic that I work with. Um, you know, the, the students there are all um, green card holders. They're all legal permanent residents of the United States trying to get their citizenship. And overwhelmingly what I hear from them is a lot of buy-in to the American dream, or otherwise they wouldn't be becoming citizens. Right? They, they know they're yeah. going to have to work yeah, hard. Yeah, that's right. I mean, some of them are old enough that they've retired or they're disabled in some way or, you know, there's something else that, that prevents them from working. But for the vast majority, they intend to work and, and work very hard during their time here. And a lot of them are cooks or landscapers or custodians, and they put passion into those jobs. And I have tremendous respect for how much they see that as a growing part of their American identity. 
a lot of them, they come here and they say, I'm going to study for the civics test and I'm going to learn English and I'm going to you know, pass all the sections of the citizenship test and I'm going to be able to vote. And the way that I do that is by working hard in my new country. That's still, I think, a huge motivator. So interesting, Desmond, to hear what you're saying about the sense of work and identity with those of your generation. This has really been enlightening for me. I, I feel like, as always, I, I learn and grow from our conversations. And it opens up my thinking to, to think of things a little bit differently. I think it's so easy for someone of my age to look kind of from my narrow prism at things, and you're able to flesh it out so well with your generation. It, it's like it's real people instead of just a, a demographic that I'm looking at, and thank you for that. That's really helpful. Well, I'm so glad. I feel similarly about uh, getting to know older folks through you as well and, and also getting a sense of the passage of time that you've been able to observe through your own eyes. Thank you for joining us on Passing the Mantle. We invite you to send your comments or ideas for topics to passingthemantle at LAist.com. That's passingthemantle at LAist.com. Don't forget to like, review, and share with your friends. And if you put effort into working with them, your family. Good to have you with us, and we'll talk with you again next week. Passing the Mantle is hosted by me, Larry Mantle. And me, Desmond Mantle. The show is a production of LAS Studios. This podcast is powered by listeners like you donating as little as $5 a month. And we can only keep making more episodes like this with your partnership. Support this program now by donating at las.com slash join. Thank you so much. Our producer and editor is Caitlin Plummer, and Megan Larson is our executive producer. Evelyn Bocanegra is our studio technician and helps edit and mix all of our episodes. And Shana Naomi Krokmal is VP of Podcasting at LA Studios. Our theme music is by Errol Ross. This podcast is supported by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. We're introducing a new podcast from L.A. Studios, Passing the Mantle. Where we explore stories that connect generations. I'm Larry Mantle, host of L.A. 89.3's Air Talk. And I'm Desmond Mantle, his son and co-host. Despite our different paths, we share a deep curiosity about the world. On Passing the Mantle, we dive into societal trends and the moments that have shaped who we are. Listen to Passing the Mantle wherever you listen to podcasts.